Thomas the founder that I hit the yes. So hello everyone, welcome, very nice to see you again and let's begin first of all by adjusting your motivation. According to uh, the, as it is said, there are two main activities, one at the beginning, one at the end. The activity at the beginning is to set the motivation and the activity at the end is to do the dedication. So first of all, begin the thinking that I am here to listen to those teachings of the Lamrim with the ultimate aim of reaching the state of enlightenment in order to benefit all mother sentient beings who are as vast as the vastness of space. So for their sake, in order to reach the state of enlightenment, I'm here today to listen, first of all, to all those stages, the graduated stages of the path to enlightenment. And after I have listened to this advice, I will reflect it. And after I have reflected upon it, I will meditate on it. In this way, I will follow all the stages of the path without ever separating, listening, contemplating, and meditating in order to reach the state of enlightenment. So with this particular thought in your, with this particular thought, please adjust your motivation, which is, as we said, it's the main activity at the beginning. Mm. So we already had uh, one class in the preliminary class that we had. We had already, we started talking about this subject. So we discussed the origin of uh, the Islam teachings and we explained that there is an origin that goes all the way back to the sutras of the Buddha. We also spoke about the subject matter. We talked about the title of the text, what it indicates. And we talked about the crucial composition of Master Atisha. So we said that obviously the teachings, we trace them all the way back to Buddha Shakyamuni. Master Atisha received the lineage of those teachings and when he went to Tibet, he composed the first text that was the lamp to the path. It became the basis, the foundation for all subsequent uh, commentaries that were composed later. Up to that point, the term Lamrim had not been applied, but from that point onward, from that lamp of the path, we, uh, we started using the term Lamrim for those texts. Yeah. Okay, so we, as we said, Master Atisha received the lineages and composed uh, these texts, the lamp of the path. Now, one of the main disciples um, of Atisha was Dromtompa. And Dromtompa observed that Master Atisha gave a lot of uh, tantric instructions to many other students, but to him, he only gave instructions of Lamrim. So one day he asked the question to Atisha. Uh, it was almost like a complaint. It's like, how come you, know, you give all these tantric instructions to others? And to me, you only give instructions on Lamrim. And Master Atisha replied saying that actually I have not, I do not have any other student who is suitable to listen to the Lambrim. You are the only one who is the vehicle who is going to be the recipient of all these Lambrim instructions. And therefore, uh, he passed on to Drum Tompa the entire lineage, the entire range of instructions of the Lambrim. So once the teachings passed on to Master Drum Tompa, from that point onwards, we have the beginning of the Kadampa lineage. And the Kadampa lineage actually has three, uh, you could say it's, it has three lines. One is the central Kadampa, the other one is the Lamrim Kadampa, and the third one is the instructions of the Kadampa. So, as we say, we have three lineages here in the Kadampa, and the first one it is, co is called the central lineage. And basically what they did is they took all the instructions that come from the lamp of the path and they put that into practice. And from there, they, that developed into six, um, they had six main lineages or six uh, main subdivisions from that with individual practitioners who carried those lineages. I don't have the entire list of their names in English, but I can provide those to you. Uh, then we had the second line, which was the Kadam Lamrimpa, the Lamrim Kadam. And again, they took the 
as the basis or the instruction that is given in the path or in the lamp of the path and they develop their own lineage of instructions. I'm going to find those names. Sorry, I don't have them. Okay, so I'm catching up now. Uh, Gishla just explained the last one of the Gadamba lineages, but I can catch up with the names. So from the Gadamba classical tradition, the lineage was handed from Potawa to Sharawa, and it led, um, it dealt with the stages of the path to enlightenment through the medium of the great classics. Then we have the Kadampa Lamrim tradition, uh, that was the lineage that passed down from Gompopa to Nizrupa, and it was a briefer treatment of the Lamrim, giving the stages of the path in different orders. And then finally, we have the Kadam tradition of the oral instruction, the third one. It came down from Geshe Chengawa to uh, Jeune Or, and this was according to the instructions of the gurus. Um, of, you know, of those teachings, mainly the 12 links, these types of instructions. So these are the three lineages of the Kadampas. Now, um, these are three Kadampa lineages came all the way down to Lama Tsongkhapa, and Lama Tsongkhapa actually received all three lineages. So he received the classical tradition of uh, Master Sharawa, he received the Lamrim tradition, he received this from uh, Rodra Doce, and also he received the Kadam tradition of the oral instructions. He became the recipient of all three. So Lama Tsongkhapa received all these instructions and then as we say he uh, engaged in the composition of the three famous Lamrim texts. So first of all using quite a lot of um, um, quotations and also reasoning he composed the most extensive which is Lamrim Chenmo and uh, then after that he compose the middle length Lamrim where he excluded some of those um, elaborate uh, quotations and so forth. And finally, he also composed the short the Lamrim, which is known also as the songs of experience. Okay, so we have seen how actually these instructions uh, are sourced in uh, the sutras. So the sutras here are the three mothers, the three present parameters, the extensive, the middling, and the condensed. And in terms of uh, non-sutric origin, we recognize the other text, the lamp of the path. And this is how the teachings, the lineage of these teachings was transmitted all the way from the perfect Buddha Shakyamuni, perfectly, completely enlightened being, all the way down to Lama Tsongkhapa. So Geshe has explained this line, this origin and line of transmission. Okay, so we have explained how we have the, in the Geluk tradition, we have the eight Lamrim texts. We have already mentioned the three basic texts from Lama Tsongkhapa. Then in addition to that, we have the essence of refined gold. We have Manjushri's own words. We have the easy path. Then we have the swift path. And finally, we have the path of excellent scripture. So together with the initial three texts, we add those six and we have the whole list of the eight texts. We have already mentioned those names last week. Now we said from those eight texts, Geshe-la has chosen to teach the easy path. The easy path is a relatively short text and Gesla would like to sort of like, it will not take long to cover this. We can do it relatively quickly by following the outlines of the text and just fleshing them out here and there. Okay, so as we say, we're going to follow the outlines. And if you look in your text, the, the, in the easy path, the first outline that we have is uh, how to, the proper way really to rely upon the, the teacher. It talks about how to practice guru devotion, the root of the path. However, traditionally, if we look at the, um, 
at the great lamb rim and at more extensive lamb rims, we see that the material is organized in four outlines. The first outline is the first subject that is presented is the greatness of the author. And this is given in order to show that the teachings have an authoritative source. The next one is the greatness of the Dharma. And the greatness of the Dharma is explained in order to increase the faith in those who are attending those teachings. The third outline is the right way to teach the Dharma. So really on the third outline, it explains how the teacher should teach and how the students should listen. And finally, in the fourth outline, we have this sequence of instructions. And the sequence of instructions begin with the first step, which is the proper way to rely on the teacher. So Geshe was saying that it he thought that it would be very good if he could mention um, briefly those three outlines that appear in the larger Lam Rim, but we seem to be uh, to to be missing here because Lama Tsongkhapa is beginning straight from the first step of the sequence, which is the proper way to rely on the Guru. Okay, so the first one, uh, as we say, traditionally, we have to talk about the greatness of the author. And in order to explain the, greater, the greatness of the author, really you have to go into the biography of the author and see what things they did, what did they achieve in their lives. But here we have a very long tradition, a very long lineage of uh, teachers starting from Buddha Shakyamuni, the fully enlightened being, all the way down to our root guru. So we're talking about a lot of biographies and there will be quite a lot of information. So Geshe says, first of all, we don't have the time to go into that. I don't know if the audience will be interested to listen to so many biographies of so many you know, great beings and so forth. Uh, however, if someone is interested, there is a text composed that has the biographies of all the lamas, the Lamrim lineage gurus. So if you're interested in this information, this is something that you can trace down and you can read it. Okay, but however, for this class, Geshe-la says, I don't have all this information and I don't think we need to go into all this information. Okay, so we come to the second outline, which is the greatness of the Dharma. The greatness of the Dharma is explained so that we can increase or we can generate faith within our own mind. So we come here and we attend some teachings. We're going to listen and later on we're going to um, contemplate and meditate on these instructions. So in order to have some respect, for what we are receiving here. It's important to look at the greatness of the Dharma, the subject matter that is taught here. And this is presented by talking about the three unique features and the four uh, special attributes. So the three unique features is that this is a complete set of instructions. The second unique feature is that it is easy to comprehend and put into practice. And the third one is that it has superiority from other, uh, let's say, presentations of advice. Okay, so we say that the first feature is that it is complete advice. So what we mean with that is that within the Lam Rim, you will find all the main points of Sutra and Tantra. They're all included. Nothing is missing. So because nothing is missing of those essential points, we say that it, this is complete advice, complete instructions. Okay, the second feature that we said is that is easily applicable, easy to practice. Why? Because all the advice that is given here is advice in order to subdue your own mind. Okay, so the third feature that we gave is that it is superior from other sets of advice. Why? Because actually this uh, Lam Rim contains instructions and uh, the speech and the teachings that are given from the two 
uh, pioneers that we have. So the two pioneers that we have is on all the path breakers. One is Master Nagajana and the other one is Master Asanga. So from the point of view of the superiority that we get from Master Asanga is that he actually has, it includes uh, both methods that we have for generating bodhicitta. We know that the lineage that came from Master Tselimpa was the, both the lineages of exchanging self and others and the lineage of remembering also we have the other lineage of the method for uh, the sevenfold method, remembering everyone as being your mother and so forth, the kindness wishing to repair the kindness. So a, from the point of view of this, because it contains both instructions for generating bodhicitta, it is superior to other texts that only uh, include uh, limited instructions or even they have no instruction for the generation of bodhicitta. Then from the point of view of the other great path breaker, Master Nagarjuna, it includes the great advice that comes from uh, the most refined, most elevated view, which is the view of the middle way consequence school. So it is the view that settles that of phenomena, although they do not exist from their own side inherently, nevertheless, they appear and they function conventionally. So it is superior because this is the view of the middle way consequence school and it's superior from any view that is from the middle way consequence autonomy school and below. So as we say, we have uh, the three special features and in addition to that, we have uh, the four greatness or the four great points that are advantage points for that. Okay, so from those uh, four great points or four advantage points, the first one is that all instruction is included, but there is no contradiction whatsoever in the instruction. So we have here a presentation that includes parts from Sutra, that includes parts from Tantra, and it basically it includes the essence of the 84,000 bundles of teachings. However, all those things are presented in a way that they are not contradictory. And because they are not contradictory and they are complete and complementing each other, you can, this is instruction where one individual can take all these instructions and progress along the path all the way to Buddhahood. So one of the gr four greatnesses is that there is no contradiction amongst the instructions that is included in this text. So that uh, thing where actually the individual who is practicing or is following this instruction can come to comprehend and utilize everything that is presented without contradiction is very important thing. Because initially when you come and you hear all these instructions, there's instruction from the great vehicle, there is sutric instruction, there is tantric in instruction. Sometimes we hear, you know, bits of advice from here and there and they appear to be contradictory. However, if you follow the Lamrim, you will see that those there is no contradiction in these different different instructions, like uh, something becomes like the main instruction and the other things become secondary or uh, auxiliaries that supplement or they help, they support the main instruction that you have to follow. And therefore, for the practitioner, it becomes easy to comprehend all these points, it becomes easy to combine them and practice in this way because the practitioner does not experience contradiction, internal contradiction. So again, we are discussing this first point, which is that you will re realize that there is no contradiction in these instructions. So everything appears to be consistent. There's no internal con contradiction. To give you an example with that, so let's say that you are unwell. So initially, the first symptoms that you have is high fever. So you go to the doctor and the doctor says, because you have this high temperature, you should not be eating any meat or drinking any alcohol. So please stop eating meat and drinking alcohol. 
That is the first instruction that you get from the doctor. Then by following this advice, actually your temperature um, goes down. So the next time that you go and see the doctor, now you don't have high temperature, but now your lung has increased. So once your lung is up, then the doctor says, oh, I think now it's time for you to have some meat and have a glass of alcohol. That will be good for your lung. So if you just said to someone, the first time I went there and he said, don't have any meat and alcohol. Second time he says, oh, now you should take meat and alcohol. Uh, it, originally, this appears to be a contradiction. However, you see that it totally fits the level that you are at and the doctor is giving exactly what is appropriate according to your condition and therefore there is no contradiction. This is a very important point for the practitioner because the practitioner has to rec reconcile all these different practices, practices of the lesser vehicle, practices of the great vehicle, practices of sutra, practices of tantra. So those things have to be coherent they have to be, it has to be a consistent stream of practice and advice. The, the different parts of the practice should not contradict or compete each other like heat and cold that are direct opposites, right? So this is one of the greatness of the lamb ring, that you understand that all this instruction is consistent, is coherent, and there is no contradiction. Okay, we now come to the second great, great point of, this, of the instructions of the Lamrim. And the second point is that all the scriptures will present as per, to yourself as personal instructions. Okay, so if we look at the Lamrim, we have a lot of subjects. So it says here, you will gain certainty, you will gain cl clarity for all these subjects, starting from the proper way to rely on the teacher all the way up to how to obtain the union of calm, abiding and special insight. First of all, this is, as we said, this is a complete set of instructions and all of them will um, appear as personal instructions to you. You will be able to follow the outlines, whether the extensive, whether the condensed one, and you will have a certainty of that. And this will then allow you to perform analytical and placement meditation. And when you do the practice as, as needed, and when you do the practice, all the different visualizations that you must have, all, all the different contemplations that you must have, all the things that you must bring into mind will appear naturally, clearly, with ease into your mind. So that is a very important point. It means that every scripture, every text that you open, you can somehow recognize it and classify it and see where it fits in the outlines of the land rim. So all the scriptures will become your personal instructions on this path to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So now we come to the third point. We have explained the first greatness that every, there is no, you see there's no contradiction in the instructions. The second point that, that all the scriptures will appear as your own personal instructions. And now we come to the third one. The third one is that by relying on the Lam Rim, you will easily understand the true thinking or the true intention of the Buddha. Now, we have many teachings of the Buddha. So we have a lot of scriptures, we have a lot of commentaries. And even though you might spend a lot of time studying those texts and those commentaries, still it is not very easy to understand what is the ultimate intention of the teacher, what is the ultimate intention of the Buddha when he taught those things. In most cases, although we try and we study, we don't understand the ultimate meaning, the ultimate intention. Or even if we are capable of finding, reaching that ultimate meaning, it will take a very long time and it's going to be a very hard work. However, if you rely upon the Lam Rim, you will easily and quickly be able to understand the ultimate uh, intention of the Buddha. 
So we see with this third point uh, that the third greatness of the Lamrim is that you will easily understand the final intention of the Buddha. So, okay, so you might be asking, what is the final intention of the Buddha? What, what is it that I'm going to understand out of it? It is actually explained uh, by our teachers, uh, the lineage of our teachers, that you, we can find the ultimate intention of the Buddha in the three principal aspects of the path that Lama Tsongkhapa has composed. So in the three principal aspects of the path, we have renunciation, we have bodhicitta, and then we have correct view. So the ultimate intention of the Buddhas is correct view. And as Lama Tsongkhapa has said in the three principal aspects of the path, the appearance of things that mutually interdepend is no illusion, but they are those who understand emptiness to be something devoid of this appearance. As long as these two seem separate to you, you will never realize the thoughts of the Great One. So very clearly he says, for as long as you see appear, conventional appearances and the ultimate reality of emptiness as being separate, for that long you don't realize the ultimate intention of the Buddha. So very clearly this is something that we can understand through the Lamrim, the correct view. So, as we say, the third greatness is that you will easily find the true intention of the Buddha. We say that we have a great body of literal literature here. We have the sutras of the Buddha, then we have the commentaries. These are very extensive works. However, all the main points of those works are included within the three principal aspects of the path. And definitely within the Lambrim, we have this structure, we have this very clear presentation of the three principal aspects of the path. So easily quickly, without much hardship, you will be able to come to this understanding of the three principal aspects of the path, and in particular, understanding of the correct view. We come now to the fourth of those greatness, and it is the greatness of allowing yourself to save yourself from the danger of falling into the abyss. So falling into the abyss here indicates uh, committing a really negative action. So this great negativity refers to the negativity of abandoning the Dharma. So if you practice the Lamrim, you save yourself from the negativity of abandoning the Dharma. So we are talking here about uh, saving yourself up from uh, very, this very dangerous uh, action or a thought that is looking at some teachings of the, the Buddha and favoring those and saying, oh, you know, those, those teachings, this class of teachings are very good, but these other teachings, actually, they are not good. And I, I like those teachings, I don't like the other teachings. This is extremely heavy negativity. This is what is described by the term, the negativity of abandoning Dharma. We actually have a quotation from the King of Single-Pointed Concentration Sutra, where exactly this problem is uh, described. So it says, abandoning the sutra basket is far heavier sin than destroying all the stupas in the southern continent. So destroying the southern continent refers to this world, right? So there are many stupas in this world. Destroying a stupa is extremely negative action. So it says to abandon the sutra pitaka equates or is it creates negativity uh, heavier than destroying all the stupas in this world so quite heavy negativity and then it continues abandoning the sutra basket is far heavier sin than killing as many arhats as there are grains of sand at the bottom of the ganges so again abandoning the sutra pitaka is even heavier negativity than killing so many arhats. How many arhats? As many grains of sand you have at the bottom of, river, of the river Ganges or at the bottom of the great ocean. So incredible negativity. By relying on the Lamrim, you will not make this discrimination of favoring some parts of the teachings against others. So you save yourself this heavy negativity. 
So uh, from the greatnesses that we're looking, right? Um, first of all, we have the greatness of the author that is given in order to explain that the advice or indicate that the instruction has an immaculate origin. Then we have the greatness of the Dharma that is given in order to generate for us, to generate respect, to appreciate what we are receiving. And within that, we talked about the special features of the Lamrim and the greatnesses of the Lamrim. Now, what comes after that is the right way to teach and to listen to those teachings. So when the Lamrim teachings are given, the students must listen in a particular way and the teacher has to teach in a particular way. Okay, so we begin by the proper way to listen to the Dharma. The proper way to listen to the Dharma comes in three subheadings. The first one is contemplating the benefits of studying the Dharma. The second one is how to show respect for the Dharma and for the teacher who is teaching it. And the third one is the actual way of listening to it. So the first thing that we will look, look at is considering the benefits of studying the Dharma. So in brief, talking about the benefits that come from studying the Dharma, we have this quotation from the saints of the Buddha that says, owing to your study, you understand Dharma. Owing to your study, you stop sinning. So owing to your study, because you do study, you understand Dharma. What you understand is what you need to take on as a practice and what you need to abandon. Then the second line says, owing to your study, you stop sinning, means you stop negativity. Why? Because you engage the higher training of ethics and in this way you abandon and negativity. So we continue with the third and the fourth line of this quotation from the sayings of the Buddha. So the third line says, owing to your study, you abandon the meaningless. So here we are talking about the high training of concentration. Um, so by focusing on the Sutra Pitaka, you develop concentration and you abandon distraction. So because the mind is not distracted, you're not engaging the meaningless, okay? So you abandon the meaningless. The last line of this quotation, owing to your study, you achieve nirvana. So here is the higher training in wisdom. By relying on the Abhidharma Pitaka, you understand all the afflictions, you understand how to abandon those afflictions, and by abandoning those afflictions, you reach the state of nirvana. So... Another, we have another quotation from the Jataka Tales that again talks about the benefits of uh, listening or studying the Dharma, where it says, study is the lamp to dispel the darkness of benightedness. It is the best of possessions. Thieves cannot rob you of it. It is the weapon to defeat your enemy, your blindness to all things. It is your best friend who instructs you on the means. It is a relative who will not desert you when you are poor. It is the medicine against sorrow it, that, that does not harm you, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of emphasis that that it is like the best, it's like the lamp or the light that will remove the darkness and it's the best of possession you could possibly have. Basically by studying, we remove our ignorance and we develop our wisdom. Okay, so from the three outlines on the way to listen to the Dharma, we have covered the first one, which is contemplating the benefits that come from studying the Dharma. The second one is how to show respect for the Dharma and its teacher. So the very important thing that is uh, discussed here is that you should revere the teacher who is teaching this Dharma, show the same respect that you show to the Buddha. You show the same respect to the teacher. And then once you understand this point, the third point is the actual way to listen to the Dharma. Okay, so in this outline, which is the actual way to listen, when we listen, uh, this is presented in two, in two ways, right? So when we listen, we listen, we have to abandon three types of fault, and we also have to cultivate six types of attitudes that are very helpful. So the three types of faults that we have to abandon uh, come with an analogy, the analogy of the vase, right? I'm sorry, we have airplane passing. So 
the first one is the fault of being like an upside down pot. The second one is being like a filthy pot. And the third one is being like a leaky pot. All right, so I'll repeat. The airplane is gone. Okay, so the first one is being like an upturned vessel. So you know when you have a vase and you have turned it upside down, it doesn't matter how much liquid you pour into it, actually everything will just flow off the sides and nothing will go inside. So this here reflects the attitude of the student who out of pride or you know not listening carefully and so forth, actually does not receive anything. It doesn't matter how good and detailed the instructions the teacher is giving, if the student is not um, open to receive these teachings, they will not receive it. So this is the first fault. The second fault is the analogy of the really filthy pot. So imagine that you have a vessel that is contaminated uh, with filth or let's say with poison. Even if you put the most delicious and nutritious food into that container, immediately that thing becomes contaminated and unsuitable to eat. So this second fault refers to the motivation because you could be going to the teachings and listening very carefully, receiving those teachings, but with what? With the motivation that I will become famous for having attended those teachings. I will receive these teachings and I will pass them on to others. I will charge for passing those to others and so forth. When you listen with that motivation, it just ruins everything. And finally, the third type of a teaching uh, comes with the analogy of a leaky pot. So if you have a pot and the bottom has a hole, it doesn't matter how much you pour in, it will just come out, it will leak out. And this indicates that you're not retaining the teachings, you're forgetting things straight away. Okay, so we have talked about the three faults to abandon and now we're going into the six attitudes that are very helpful to have. So first of all, number one, the attitude that you are like the patient. Number two, the attitude that the Dharma is like the medicine. Number three, the attitude that the teacher is like a skilled physician. Number four, the attitude that, that your practice is like the cure. Number five, the attitude that your spiritual guide is the Buddha himself. Number six is the attitude that the Dharma should remain for a long time. So the first attitude that should have is this recognition that I am like a patient. And usually when you say this to people, they say, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not sick. I'm not a patient. But here when we say this recognition that you are the patient, you have to understand that since beginningless time, we are afflicted. We are under the influence of afflictions. But the thing is, we don't know it. So we don't recognize this. So since beginningless time, we have become like the domain of afflictions. Every time of affliction is present and it's present very strongly, very predominantly. So they're all present and they're influencing us. So we are sick in that way. Okay, so we come to the second recognition, which is the attitude of seeing the Dharma as being like the medicine. So we say we have all these afflictions, like we are the ground of afflictions, attachment, hatred, jealousy, and all other afflictions. If we want to remove those, if we want to eliminate them, we need an agent that will remove them. And that thing is the Dharma. So in that sense, the Dharma is like the medicine, just like in ordinary life, when we get sick and we want to get rid of the illness, the pathogen, we take a medicine and the medicine clears that away. The third one is the attitude that recognizes the spiritual teacher as being a very skilled doctor. So it is, uh, uh, he's the doctor because he's the one who is guiding us and explaining what is to be practiced and what is to be abandoned. And we may put a lot of emphasis here in the word skillful because you could go to a doctor and if the doctor is not skillful, you can end up being worse off 
than what more sick than what you have when you initially went to visit. But here you're dealing with someone who is very skillful and has the capacity to guide you, to nudge you along the way, to properly explain that you need to abandon this, you need to practice this. On ourselves, on our own, we could not figure that out clearly. So this, we need to rely on the very skilled physician who indicates what we should do. The fourth attitude we should have is that our diligent practice is like the cure. It will be the cure. So it is quite important here to understand that, let's say you went to the doctor, the doctor is very skilled, the doctor has properly diagnosed you and has given you a medicine. Now from your side, what you have to do is to take that medicine and you have to take the whole course of the medicine and you have to take the medicine according to instructions. So it's not good to say, yes, yes, I'm going to take care of my health. I went to the doctor and they gave me this medicine. And then from the whole strip of pills, you just take the first one and you discard the rest. The rest one you just leave in your little uh, table next to your next to your bed and you just forget to take the entire course of antibiotics for example so that's not the correct way and if you do it in this way you will not see an improvement you will not see the improvement and this is not the fault of the doctor and it is not the fault of the medicine it is your own fault for not relying upon the advice properly so the same thing happens with our practice like we receive the instructions of what we have to practice and how we have to practice it. And then we have to diligently put it into practice. If we, if we only practice half of the things or if we you know, receive the advice but don't put it into practice, it will be like you know, there will be no improvement and that will be our own fault. The fifth one, you have the recognition, the attitude that your spiritual guide is a holy being, just like the Buddha. So the teacher who is teaching you the Lam Rim, you have to regard him with incredible respect. And you have, as you are relating to this teacher, you have to remember the kindness of our teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni. We have explained that the origin of those uh, teachings goes all the way back to Buddha Shakyamuni. And what your current teacher who is teaching the, the Lam Rim is to uh, convey to you exactly the same teaching the same instructions of what to abandon and what to take on as a practice and they do this in an unerring unmistaken manner so that being who is explaining to you the teachings of the Buddha just as the Buddha would like directly he's the one that comes to you to teach you those things you should really recognize as a holy being and show the appropriate respect Okay, so we come now to the six of those very helpful attitudes that the students should have. And this is the attitude that the Dharma should remain for a very long time. So as you are receiving those teachings, you should have this wish or this appreciation saying, you know, it will be wonderful uh, if uh, these, uh, you know, teachings were to remain for a very long time. Okay, so we have gone here through you know, the way to listen to the Dharma. And we have explained, it comes into three outlines. The first one is contemplating the benefits of studying the Dharma. The second one is how to show respect for the Dharma and its teacher. And the third one is the actual way to listen to it. So we have gone through the outlines that explain how the students are supposed to be listening to this. What comes after that, or together with that, is how the teacher is uh, supposed to teach. So it has a little bit of material. Again, it has its own presentation, but Geshe is suggesting that we actually stop here for tonight. Um, and um, 
we can dedicate the time to questions and answers after that. But just to recapture where we are and why, you know, what we have done, we have gone through explaining the greatness of the author. Then we have explained the greatness of the Dharma. And we're going to complete the third one. We have done at least half of the third one, which is the right way to teach and the right way to listen. We've done the right way to listen. So next week, we're going to do the right way to teach. And then from that, we're going to come to the actual text, which is because we go into the sequence of instructions. So we will start with the easy path that straight away begins with the first sequence of instructions, which is the proper way to listen to the te to rely on the teacher. Okay, so this is coming next week. We're actually starting our text from next week. So that is for this week, and now we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. We have twenty minutes. Oh, <laughs> 嗯，主要当部的是啥？对，特别从哪落的？哦，特别去那么细吧，就特别地方的多吧，这那特别地方的多吧，这是要的，开始现在的定义经济老板了。哦，对的，要的，初生的老板嘛，都要开始那些。
uh, countless beings who have reached the state of Buddhahood. So in the beginning, all of them, they generated the mind of bodhicitta, the aspiration to become enlightened for the sake of all sentient beings. Then in the middle, they spent a very long time building up the two types of accumulation. And they did it in order to achieve that particular goal. And at the very end, they actualized enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. Once they actualized enlightenment, which is for the sake of us, for the sake of sentient beings, then from that point onwards, they carry out activities to benefit sentient beings. It is true, there are many different types of activities that can benefit sentient beings, but it is said that the best activity is the teaching activity. So there is this quotation that says, among activities of the Buddha, the supreme is the activity of the speech. So it indicates the teaching. So logically, you have to think, you know, they must be this being who is teaching me in the Lamrim, who is explaining to me what I have to abandon and what I have to adopt as a practice must be a Buddha. It cannot be any other way because this would be the most beneficial activity. If this person was, if that being was not a Buddha, then it would be a lie that the Buddha's become enlightened and from that point onwards they work for the benefit of all sentient beings if they don't come to teach me how would they benefit me if they don't benefit me why do they become enlightened so think along this way until you reach the certainty until you reach the conclusion that says he must definitely be a buddha there is no other way if he's not a Buddha, then this thing that they become enlightened for the sake of benefiting sentient beings must be a lie. So it is not a lie, therefore he is a Buddha. We also have quotations. Quotations from, in the sutras from the Buddha himself, who said, uh, is giving advice like, I will, and do not worry, after I pass into Paranirvana, I will appear in the form of the teacher and so forth. There are many quotations like this. So combine reason, logical reasoning, and quotations until you reach that certainty that allows you to recognize the teacher as the Buddha. All right, okay, so the question was, what is the difference between studying by relying on a, on a teacher and and studying on your own without relying on the teacher. So Geshe was saying, actually, we have many examples. There are many cases of people who decided, I'll do this on my own. I don't need to rely on a teacher. And we can see uh, how they ended up following the wrong path or misinterpreting the advice. There is, of course, you can study on your own and you can derive some understanding, but you will not derive the full benefit. And there's always the danger that you will misunderstand certain things and that you will miss out quite a lot of instructions. So you won't get the full benefit. There is this analogy that they say that if you want to start a fire, you, can, you have the rays of the sun, they're quite hot themselves. But if you have a magnifying glass then, or a crystal, then the crystal or the magnifying glass actually focuses all the rays of the sun and they come on one spot. And this is how you can start a fire. And this magnifying glass or the crystal of the glass actually represents the teacher. On one hand, we have the teachings of the Buddha. And on the other hand, we have the student, the disciple who wants to train. And something needs to come in between to facilitate this exchange of information. And this is the teacher. So we need the teacher in order to have the full benefit. Okay, there were other bits and pieces in between that we missed, but that's the gist of it. Okay, so now we will uh, do dedications together. Uh, we will.